welcome back to the Mank Entrepreneur YouTube channel and to a sunny day here in Manchester. And I'm on my way to the Channel Advisor Catalyst event here in Manchester. Um, and yeah, luckily it's <laughs> not too far from where I live, which is a bonus. But yeah, so if, if anyone doesn't know, Channel Advisor are huge, uh, if not one of the largest multi-channel software uh, company provider solutions uh, in the world. And every year they host two sort of events, one in the USA and one here in the UK. And this year in the UK it's here in uh, Manchester. So we're going to go along and see what it is they've got to, uh, they've got to say. There's supposed to be, I think Google are here and Mary Portis. Uh, so yeah, I'm actually going to try and do a much better job of sharing uh, what's going on here with you. So let's see how it goes. Finally, what Channel Advisor is doing to help keep you connected. So let's get started with a, a quick recap of the current e-commerce landscape. E-commerce, as I'm sure all of you know, continues its steady march upward. It's gaining share around the world uh, as a share of overall retail spend from the UK to China, India to the US, Russia to Brazil. And the latest estimates put e-commerce at about a $1.9 trillion industry uh, market in 2016 growing to four trillion, four trillion by 2020. And while you can see that Western Europe here represented in green is significant and doing pretty well, Asia is actually today the vast majority of e-commerce and is still growing the fastest. In fact, eMarketer predicts that China will be the first country to hit one trillion dollars in e-commerce sales and will hit that actually this year, if you can believe it. And India, while still relatively small today, is expected to grow over 30% compound over the next few years, and it represents a significant uh, growth opportunity. Now, turning our attention to the UK specifically, IMRG estimates that UK e-commerce sales were roughly 133 billion pounds this year, to, or excuse me, in 2016, up about 16% year on year, and Germany e-commerce sales were 67 billion euro, growing 12%. And so the trend of worldwide e-commerce growing as a share of overall retail spend continues unabated. And there's plenty of room to run in the UK. E-commerce share of overall spend, uh, overall retail sales, was 14% in 2016, up 1% 1 1 from the prior year. So we don't think there's any trouble, any, any obstacle with this continuing to increase, especially as e-commerce continues to become more and more convenient for consumers. 40% off televisions, for example, and other retailers like Curry's and PC World uh, fighting back to, to run promotions as early as, as you know, 10 days before Black Friday. So really a very aggressive uh, pricing environment in the last holiday. And so we continue to see this phenomenon of retailers continuing to siphon demand earlier and earlier and try to get a jump on the Christmas selling season with, with aggressive deals. 3%, but no matter how you look at it, the majority of e-commerce growth in the US is accruing to Amazon's benefit, which is pretty remarkable. And as I mentioned previously, Amazon is 27% of the e-commerce market in the UK, 40% in Germany, and it's possible, I'd say likely in the next few years, that Amazon is gonna drive the majority of all e-commerce in the UK and Germany. And it's probably gonna happen in the next year or two in the US, imagine that, Amazon's gonna drive the majority. And when you think that somehow that sounds crazy, I want to remind you that we just talked about Alibaba owning 80% of the Chinese market. So a similar outcome in other regions is really not out of the question, and I'll talk about why mobile drives that in a moment. Now this chart shows where people start their product search. This is another thing that shows you that the, the market share they have is really kind of a lagging indicator. This is more of a, of a leading indicator. Uh, and it shows that Amazon has been chewing up market share since this first report first came out in 2012. In just the last year, they went from 44% of initial product searches starting on Amazon to 55%. Uh, they're not focused specifically on market share. They're focused on how to make customers happy as, as you know, with close to 100% perfectionist that they can and anything that's gonna create value and, and reduce costs and increase speed. And so if you think of Amazon as a giant verticalization with massive cash flows to support those investments in, in, a, in a number of different areas, it's really about their focus on the customer that makes that happen. And of course, everybody's looking for the thermal exhaust port. Uh, we found that other plan, but we haven't shared it yet with everybody, so I don't think anybody's found that yet. So when I look out in a few years, and I try to come up with some predictions for Amazon, the hard part, honestly, is just whittling the list down to five, but I'll, I'll do my best here. So, and here's how I think about these things, right? Amazon, if you look at Amazon, you know, I think a lot of people think, you know, 
how does Amazon do it? And I actually think from the outside looking in, their mentality is not that hard, right? Executing is hard, but the mentality, their, their view of the world is not that difficult to understand. That was a lot of information, and a lot of numbers, a lot of graphs. I'm wondering now how on earth I got on and did it, because I didn't know any of that stuff. Um, and this is a, well, it's not even a lectern, so this is probably the low-tech point of your day. Uh, Cambridge Central is um, a brand. Um, you'll see I didn't set out to create a brand, but it is a brand. I think that maybe whereas the first part of today has sort of really um, concentrated on your head, Cambridge Satchel has succeeded by uh, appealing to people's hearts, and uh, that's what we will continue to do. And so um, I'm not going to, to have my head done by the Amazon thing. And, and my first option was punting, but when, when I found all the images of punting and then knew it would be sort of like pressed on a satchel, uh, a man with a punt pole actually looks like a man, best case, with a snooker cue. Um, it, or some like variant of a man with a, who's, who's going to leap and, and jump this vast distance over something, a pole vaulter. So that wasn't going to work. It looked, it looked actually really confusing. Um, and so I thought, okay, what else does Cambridge have? I know, I know it has bikes. So found a little clip art thing of a bike monkeyed around with it so it wasn't too complicated to, to press into leather and it looked a bit amateurish. The Cambridge Satchel Company in a bike. But then, if you go up to the top and you look on word art, there's this thing that's called bend <laughs> and you click it and it goes the Cambridge Satchel Company and the bike's in the middle and it looks great. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, the logo's done. So the logo's done. It was like the name and logo, 45 minutes tops. Um, I, later on, I found out, you know, this what people have spent on their logos is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. But when you don't even know if your business is going to succeed, why would you do that? You know, why would you spend loads and loads of money on that in the beginning when you don't even know if it's going to go down the pipes or not. And so it was great and we started selling to them and it was, it was absolutely fantastic. The other thing I would say is, you know, know your constraints. My constraints were, by that stage then, I had four UK manufacturers. They were all really small because if you employ more than a certain number of people, you've got to have a health and safety representative and they didn't want that so. So I was limited to about 150 bags a week from each one of those four. So because of this, there was a slight mismatch and I had 16,000 back orders. <laughs> and you know, I could sort of get 600 bags a week. But um, this is when people start telling you things like, Oh, it's a good problem to have. Well, it, it, it's really not that great a problem to have because everybody emails you and says, where's my bag? And when you've got 600 coming in a week and, you know, some of them a bit dodgy so you can't sell them, and you've got 16,000 people wanting their bags, it doesn't feel that great. Well, hello everyone. As Mike said, I'm Adam Joseph, Director of Client Services at Channel Advisor. I'm thrilled to be joined on stage by, by Mary. Mary, I know Mike just gave a quick plotted history of your career and some of your successes, but it would be great to hear that in your own words as well and how you first ventured into retail. Um, well, I wanted to be an actress, believe it or not. Um, and I got into RADA. All my, all my years at school, I was going to be an actress, but I lost my parents within two and a half years of each other. Both died and by the time I was 19, and so I kind of my world went upside down. Um, you'll have to read my memoir. To understand that bit. But um, I so I ended up going to a local college so I could be with my brother, in fact, in Watford. Mm. We both realise that we're from Watford. Well, I'm actually from Watford, he's living. I'm there. an adopted son. Um, mm. And um, I, it was about training you in the art of visual merchandising and store design. And I was terrible on the course because I just was still in sort of grief process and just was naughty and 
didn't know what I wanted to do, didn't want to be there, and just thought, oh, I don't want to be a shop girl, that's for sure. Kinky knickers, have I got that right? Ah. Yeah, so I know you opened up a factory here as well, so I'm sure you see the kind of growing, you know, the north generally in Manchester more specifically as a real growth area. God, Manchester's amazing. Like, I'm a Morrissey fan, who wasn't, but I, you know, the Smiths, and he used to talk about depression and all that thing, because he's a few years older than me, but not that much. You know, when you came to Manchester, I, I knew what you felt like. Listen, I grew up in Watford when it wasn't cool, <laughs> and I was one of those sort of Irish Catholic second generation kids with no money, and everything was just grey, and it was the 70s. <laughs> like, people go, oh, it was so cool then. Well, the only cool thing was Bowie and Mark Bowen, and the rest was shit. And so <laughs> he talked about this, you know, and his music, and he looked at Manchester, and it was just grey, and it was the industry, and all the buildings were like, so I came back, I hadn't been back for years, and I, you know, when I, when I was um, the VM manager of the top shop, I used to travel the country, and that's how I really got to know the country, which is brilliant. But I came back, and I wanted to look at manufacturing, because so I've got this thing that I know what will happen is that we will we'll never, ever get back manufacturing in the way that we, we've lost it globally, you know. I thought, can we, re the, 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 the channel came to me and they said, listen, we'd love you to see if you could compete on making a four pair, four pound pair of jeans with Primark. What a great show that would make. And I thought, no it won't, because that means some little bastard needs to be abused somewhere. We are never going to be able to make that kind of, and that might be funny for a bit, but it ain't that bloody funny. There's always someone along the line. And so, I, we're never going to get it back into that. But I said, I'll tell you what, I'll do a premium product. Not ridiculously expensive, I reckon we could produce that. And so I opened up this factory, which hadn't been uh, working in years, and um, I interviewed all these kids who were out of work. And on the day we put out the ad, a couple of days, and they were queuing up outside the factory. Some of them were scary, he just burnt the tax on his neck, and he was like, my mum's never worked and I've never worked and I don't see why I should have done that. I'm all right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, no, you're going to me. You know? So anyway, we opened up, we took out eight kids who've never worked. And then I realised there was no one to train them because all the women who were the incredible seamstresses had just gone to work for Tesco's or stacking shelves and what the new economy was. And there was one woman who we knew lived locally who was stacking shelves at Tesco's and we tried to get her. She said, no, I can't leave my job, Mary, it's not going to work. And I said, will you come in in the evenings? And she came in and she trained them. And of course, we're now five years old, there's 32 staff and we're making kinky niggas. But I went round to, I, I cheated a bit, I went round to every chief exec and said, will you buy 10,000 pairs of these knickers? I'm going to retail them at 10 quid. And even the MD of Boots said, yeah, I'll do it. Boots don't sell knickers. <laughs> and, and they all bought some blessing. ASOS put a load online. I mean, they were just incredible. Just to kickstart it, they went to Marks and Spencer's and he went, oh, we've got a really big knicker department. We don't need that. Like, you're missing the point, mate. You're missing the point. You're missing a point on a lot of things, which is why you're in the state you're in. <laughs> you're missing a big point here. And wouldn't people just love you for saying, do you know what? There's a party here where we're just going to sell British knickers. They're probably going to be a quid more than the others. But it means that all these gorgeous little kids up north have got a job who haven't had a job. I'd buy that. Anyway, most people did. So it was a success story and just heartwarmingly fantastic. So, you know, I, I've just bought a house in the country and I've had to deal with Sky. I want to put a gun so far down my throat that I actually want... I even said to the Sky guys, I know, I know. I said, you work for them? Because I know. It's shocking. Shocking. Same with BT. You think, how can you be so big and so crap? You know? And someone's going to come along and just put you out and do this better. But it's about... I, I, I don't want to communicate with you on Twitter. Because I, just, I go, I, oh, okay, I know the public. Like, so I normally get quite a quick response. But I got to a Virgin train and I booked first class and I'd been filming and then doing the lecture and I was knackered. And the train was cancelled and then we had to get on the next one. I was on my book tour. <clears throat> and they just filled the whole first class with all the people who had paid first class tickets uh, because their train was cancelled. And so I got on a lot of people in the arm and all people in my seat. And of course, I wasn't going to go get out, I've paid. You know, like some. You didn't big do the Jeremy dinner. Corbyn had to sit by the toilet, did you? Yeah. No, I did sit in the middle. I did sit in the middle of the aisle, but he wouldn't have paid first class. I paid more. I paid it because I was knackered, you know. So I was sitting in the middle of the and I said to my publisher, take a photo of my like that. <laughs> and uh, we, we put it up to Virgin, it's shocking, you know, blah, blah. And they straight away came back onto it and said, I'm really sorry, you must understand, we've had this cancelled. And they gave all the reasons why. And everybody paid, even if they paid first class, which you were totally right. There was no way I was going to kick something out of my seat. 
And when I got off in Euston, someone was at the gate very sweetly and said, look, there's two business class tickets next time. And it wasn't just for me, they were doing it for everybody. So I just thought that was such a nice touch, really well done. And the thing was, I didn't have to go through to, you know, a, a phone in India, which I do with Sky, where someone just didn't know what planet I'm on, let alone what part of the UK I'm on. <laughs> and it was quick, it was efficient. It was using social media to do that. I mean, it's, it's a massive opportunity, right? And when your market is shrinking, or when competition is being harder and harder, you look at all the markets, and markets actually are looking dramatically for the type of inventory we have. So um, the question is, um, do you want to do progressively one by one, or do you want to expand massively and move all over? But is your, camp is your company, is your business set up to uh, manage the growth? Because mm -hmm. selling internationally means growth. <laughs> I think along those lines too, if you look at the, basically the difficulty of integration is a key role for a lot of sellers looking to come on board via marketplaces, um, how difficult it is actually to do that, and then what can that marketplace offer in terms of the size of the off, the size of the marketplace in general, and the different countries and even the, the different markets that they can touch upon. Cool. Anyone else want to jump in? I, mean, I, would, I would also say that from, from our perspective, um, you know, we have an international audience, it's about empowering sellers to you know, reach those other countries. So partially, you know, built into our marketplace, we have, we've already built in the demand, we're, we're targeting customers already, um, but the next thing is kind of um, educating sellers on you know, how, to, how to ship to different countries and providing support when it comes to other languages. So um, you know, those are certainly things that, that you just have to help sellers you know, make that step because it is, it is daunting on the uh, parents. I feel very humble with those guys because actually <laughs> it's like a bunch of teenagers and eBay is 22 years old and so um, we had to transform the company um, and when I joined there was a, a specific uh, mobile department and this doesn't exist anymore because everything we do is primarily driven by mobile and so mobile is embedded into everything we do mm -hmm. and then we adapt for desktop but not the other way around so everything is built for mobile and I guess for you guys it's, it's the same, right? We have um, half of our transactions, 50% of transactions going on, on mobile, mm -hmm. and we have um, 12 uh, millions new listings per week on mobile. So it's, it's there, it's just embedded into what we do. Yeah. So James, obviously you are hard. Um, specific predictions are very hard. If I was any good at specific predictions, I would have lumped on Chelsea for what for three last night, and you would be standing staring at an empty stage. So I will be talking about forecasts and trends rather than anything in particular that's specific. How can your business help people make decisions? How can you make it more simple? So first example I want to talk about here was Hilton. Um, they put a load of time and effort into their app. And initially, it doesn't sound that amazing. You can reserve your room on the app. Nobody's that surprised by that. You can choose your room and check the view. But I think most usefully, your phone can then become your room key. So that you don't have to queue to get in. And we've all done that. We've all arrived at a hotel, either in a group or behind a group, and been frustrated at how long it takes us to get to our room. So the Hilton app allows you to bypass that. Once you're in your room, you can order, obviously, room service, but extra pillows, anything you might want. You can order an Uber to get you out if you're going out for dinner or whatever. But there's so much utility in that app. This is Google Home. Um, so yeah, I hope you can talk about Alexa. I am going to come here and talk about Google Assistant. Um, so this is bringing a a layer of conversation, if you like, to the interaction with, with the web, with online, with information. The Google Assistant can have a two-way conversation. It can remember what you've been talking about and answer a second question or a third question. And it can help bring that level of context to what you're doing. I think what we'll do is we'll do this two ways around. I've got a small demo, which I, I couldn't get my phone to talk to the screen, so I'm going to have to cut that a bit. So let's play the video. And then I'll do a quick demo. When we started, we made this for everyone. So that everyone could find anything they need among the millions of bazillions of things in the world. Today, it seems like sometimes it's easy to feel like you need a little help with the stuff just in your own world. 
Your photos, phone, videos, calendars, messages, friends, trips, reservations, and so on and so on. Wouldn't it be nice if you had some help with all that? Wouldn't it be nice if you had a Google for your world? That's why we're building the Google Assistant. Hi, Amy. How can I help? You just ask it what you need. Okay, Google. What do I have to do today? And your assistant understands and helps you out. You can even carry on a conversation with it. How long will it take to get to downtown Chicago from home? Here we go. What restaurants are there? Book a table at Cortino Restaurant. Sure. And the assistant is always there for you. So if you're on the road, you can ask it where to fill up. And if you're at home, you can ask it to play some music. Or if you're in a chat with a friend, it can show you what's playing tonight. It's like your own personal Google. Naturally, anything you share with it is safe and secure. And the more you use your Google Assistant, the more useful it becomes. Remember my bike combo is 326. Got it. And soon, you'll be able to access it from all sorts of places. So it will be everywhere you are. We made this for everyone. And today, we're making this just for you. Hi, how can I help? Meet your Google Assistant. So that's the idea. Um, and I think you can see how that will develop over time. But let's try. Uh, live demo is always risky. Quite nervous right now. But let's um, let's give this a go. And hopefully, I need to check this and pick up on my mic. So um, I think I'll hold it back here. Okay, Google. How does my day look today? Okay, Google, tell me a joke. <laughs> okay, here you go. How much does a pirate pay for corn? A buccaneer. It's a slightly American joke. <laughs> uh, is Google Translate. What this does is it looks at a sign, uh, a real life sign, that the phone will recognize that and play it back to you in the language that you want, all in real time. Um, we did this by taking a very big data set, that was my third one, a big data set of millions of labelled signs and, it's this, and then threw that at the machine to work through that. This machine learning combined with big data sets drives real improvement. This particular exercise on Translate made a bigger change in our ability to get close to human translation. Human translation is still much better than machine translation. But this exercise in itself halved the gap between where we were with human translation and machine translation. So we're really excited about this. We're, we're going to make significant strides in translation in the next few months and years. So, three trends I want to talk to you about. Machine learning is one. I'll spend a bit more time on that in a moment. I'm going to talk about immersive technology, virtual reality, and finally I'm going to talk about assistance. Um, so, let's have a look at first at machine learning. Let's start with an example of us. So at Google, we spend a lot of money on servers and on running servers and on building server farms and then trying to reduce the energy that those server farms consume. We have an ambition to be 100% renewable on the energy that we use and part of the way to do that is just to reduce the total amount of energy that we need. And we have had some of our brightest minds working on this problem for many years and making all sorts of clever improvements into how we cool server buildings, how we get more computing power, such to the point that in, the, in five years, which was about a year and a half ago, in the five years up to then, we got three and a half times the computing power out of the same energy. And lastly, we're entering the age of the system, which provides another opportunity for winners and losers to emerge. 
And in the retail space, the winners will be those businesses who are able to service the right products to the right people at the right time. So at Google, we've been working on the concept of assistance for a while. And hundreds of millions of, uh, of users already have access to an assistant and use them in their daily lives. Be it through voice on Google Assistant, uh, or also simply on their mobile phones. Uh, yeah, using the Google Now product. And we're trying, to, we're trying to bring this, we're trying to take these learnings and apply them to our vertical products. And of course, shopping is at the forefront here. Using Google Now to surface uh, to, sur to surface shopping cards to help with the purchase process. Through these shopping assistant cards, a user can pick up a user journey from where they left off. They can have fast, immediate access to buying guides, read reviews, and be pushed the products that they're, that they're interested in. And the way we search, as Tim mentioned, is beginning to shift enormously. The concept of search as a text box is now slowly, surely moving away to many other formats. And of course, voice is at the forefront of this. And again, I'm going to mention the 2020 date, but by which point we estimate that 30% of, of searches will happen without a screen. And if that seems like a big leap, consider that on our Android platform, we already see one in five searches coming from voice. So search is truly moving from our fingers to our voice. So there we have it. That was pretty much the full day of the uh, Catalyst event in 2017 here in Manchester. And it's been a pretty good day. You've seen uh, the keynote from David Spitz. You've seen Julie Dean from the Cambridge Satchel Company, Mary Portis. And then finally at the end there you saw a uh, couple of uh, couple of guys from Google talking all about what they're up to, uh, specifically around the assistant and how uh, they're working on different types of assistance in terms of everything Google, from Google Shopping to other bits of automation within the home. So that's really interesting and something which I think is definitely one to look out for. Like right now, Amazon owns the voice demand space, but Google, uh, Google are coming for it. Um, which is something which I predicted a couple of weeks ago in a, in a webinar. Um, so Amazon currently have 70% market share with Google at around 23%. Uh, but I think that's largely because Amazon was first to market with the product and, and I think Google are coming. So with that said, uh, I hope that you found this vlog useful. I've tried to record much more content from the day to share with you. Uh, if you have, hit that thumbs up button. It does mean a lot. And subscribe if you are new. Uh, there is new content every single weekday and actually today I'm going to do something very different and uh, Mary Portis is actually going to end the end the vlog with something with how she ended her talk here today in Manchester. I think it was incredibly poignant and uh, a reminder for us all. So with that said, thank you for watching and I'll catch you in the next video. And the biggest successes in my life is when I've come to the edge and, and actually pushed through that fear. Uh, when I've literally had nothing, I'm not, I, I mean, not a roof over my head. And when I was a, a, a auditioning to go to RADA, and I lost my parents, and my mother died, and I just thought, I cannot do this. And my drama teacher took me aside and read me this poem. And I went, I got in, I didn't go. But I just want to give it to you because it's the most important thing to me. Come to the edge. We can't. Come to the edge. We're frightened. Come to the edge. And they came. And he pushed them.